Okay. So yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Um, I'm going to be telling you today about the Halo model, um, which is a, a really powerful tool as a cosmologist. Um, and so that's a, a topic I've, I've worked on quite a bit in the past, and I'm really excited to, to tell you a few things about. Um, and um, what I would like at the end of this uh, lecture is for you to take away the following things. Um, so one, that you understand the principles, the assumptions, and some of the derivations that go into uh, halo models. Uh, two, that you know of the many applications of those halo models, uh, because there are many, and I'll go through a lot of them. Um, and three, very important thing, that you know some of the limitations of these halo models. And some of them um, are well known, some of the others are a bit less, less known, and I think it's very important to be aware of them. And finally, um, I'd like you to uh, be able to find more information on any, any of the topics that I'll be talking about if you need to. Uh, and to do this, I'll, I'll start with just a list of references. Um, so some of the, um, the seminal papers on this topic, the HALO model, uh, are from people that uh, you know in Berkeley. Uh, this uh, review by Kure and Chef um, is really a um, very big comprehensive uh, review on the topic of the HALO model. So if you have any question after this, that's a good place to start. And then if you're interested in some of the more um, technical aspects of the derivations uh, and you want uh, pedagogical and rigorous ones, I invite you to look at, um, at these papers. Uh, finally, here I'm listing only one example uh, paper for each of these observables that the HALO model lets you predict. Uh, one is the thermal sunyev zeldovich effect. I'll say what this is. Uh, the cosmic infrared background and uh, line intensity mapping. And again, I'll, I'll say what those things are. Um, um, some other topics that I'll mention, but won't uh, go into in too much details. Uh, there are sort of advanced topics for the HALO model are here, and I'm just listing some references in case anyone's interested. Um, and something that uh, might be useful is that uh, pretty much everything I'm going to show uh, today is implemented in this code, uh, HALOGEN. This is a code that I've, I've written and worked with in a number of uh, papers. And uh, so it's on in this repository if you want to go take a look. And that might be helpful if you ever need a HALO model for any of your research projects, feel free to use that one. Or if you're just uh, interested in how to code up uh, or some details of any of the ingredients, uh, you'll find them in, in this code. So um, for the lecture today, I'll start with explaining uh, what this HALO model is, uh, what are its goals, what are the, its principles, its assumptions, and what are the ingredients that go into it. So that will be a big part. Um, after that, I'll walk you through one derivation, which is how the HALO model can be used to derive uh, the nonlinear matter power spectrum. And then I'll briefly list a number of other applications of the HALO models. Um, and these are things where um, I've actually been using the HALO model quite a bit. And finally, I'll list um, some of the common issues with HALO models, some of the limitations um, that I just talked about. So um, let's, let's get started. What's the HALO model? What are we trying to do here? Um, so there, there's a number of goals, uh, things we're trying to achieve with this HALO model. Um, and the first one is basically, uh, in general, modeling the statistics of many large scale structure observables. And so those observables might be um, things like galaxy clustering, uh, matter clustering, um, gas density pressure in the universe, things like lensing of galaxies or the cosmic microwave background, um, thermal sunyev zeldovich effect, which I mentioned, intensity mapping, et cetera. So, and that's actually one of the, the values of the HALO model is that it's extremely versatile. So with this model, uh, you can predict auto and cross power spectra for many, many different observables, um, some of which I just listed. Um, and this model lets you account for a number of realistic effects uh, such as masking, we'll, we'll see what that means later. And it lets you relate these quantities to other observables like cluster counts. Um, so when you try to count how many galaxy clusters you find in a given survey, or things like galaxy luminosity function. So not only does it let you predict auto and cross power spectra of these observables, uh, it lets you relate them uh, to those cluster counts and luminosity functions. Another value of the HALO model is that not only do you predict um, power spectra, but you can actually predict um, all sorts of high order statistics. So things like bispectrum, trispectrum, um, endpoint function with higher n. And this is useful uh, in particular if you care about covariances between, for example, power spectra. So those covariances are useful if you're, say, trying to combine different power spectra in a joint cosmological analysis. You need to know about the covariances. Um, and finally, um, 
one of the key value of the Halo model is that it's very simple and intuitive in the sense that there's only a few physical ingredients that go into um, that model. And it's intuitive because it lets you relate a lot of the astrophysical properties of galaxies um, to their statistics like endpoint correlations. Um, so, so these are the goals of the Halo model. And this is why I think as a cosmologist, it's very useful uh, to know about it. Um, so going through the, the assumptions, in principle, they're, they're fairly simple. Um, and uh, the idea is that if you look at an n-body simulation of dark matter in the universe, um, you might find that um, what you see looks kind of similar to a set of dots where all the mass would be concentrated. And these are called dark matter halos. And uh, a halo model is going to be useful for you every time that individual, hal host, individual halos host all of the quantity you care about in the universe. And again, that quantity observable can be mass, uh, galaxies, gas density, pressure, et cetera. So for example, if you care about um, the clustering of galaxies, uh, the halo model is going to assume that individual halos host all of the galaxies in the universe. And as a result, um, any observable or statistics uh, of the quantity you care about, maybe galaxies, is determined mostly by two things. One, uh, the distribution of dark matter halos. And here that means how many halos there are, where they are. And two, what are their profiles in terms of the observable you care about? For example, in a given dark matter halo, how are the galaxies distributed? How spread out are they? So that's the key uh, assumption of the halo model is that um, hopefully the quantity you care about uh, is made of objects that only live inside of halos. And therefore to predict their statistics, all you need to know is where are the halos and what are their profiles? Um, so let's, let's now go into those ingredients about uh, where are the halos, what are their profiles, and start uh, ingredient number one, the halo mass distribution function. And this basically answers the question of how many halos are there of a given mass. And uh, in the simplest halo models, um, your observable uh, is related to the halo only through mass. So that's the simplest model. Uh, in, in, in practice, things like you know, number of galaxy may depend on other things than halo mass, uh, but that's the first step, the first approximation. And um, to do this, we then uh, describe the number, the mean number density of halos of a given mass at a given redshift by this quantity called the halo mass function, uh, dndm, uh, which I'll, I'll write and is often written n of m. So n of m dm is the mean number density of halos of mass m and redshifts. So that's, that's a key ingredient in the halo model, uh, the halo mass function. And there are various ways um, to predict it or to estimate it. Um, there's very interesting first principle calculation for what the halo mass function uh, should be. And an example includes uh, the press sector mass function. And then other fitting functions have been derived by looking at n-body simulations. And so these might be the chef and Torman or the tinker mass function. And so these names are names that you'll hear all the time when people talk about halo model. Uh, people might be using the press sector mass function, the chef Thorman mass function, or the tinker mass function. And uh, if you ever need any of them, again, they're implemented in this code, in this code halo gen that I, I talked about. Um, so now if you ask, how does this, uh, what does this mass function look like in practice? I've plotted it here as a function of mass. And so each line is a different redshift. So if you start at, at redshift zero, that's the, the black line, uh, the features you see in this halo mass function are uh, a power low at low mass, and then an exponential suppression um, at high masses. And uh, this is um, basically what you'll find in any um, halo mass function fitting function. And then as you increase in redshift, uh, you see that the curve goes down because as you go to higher redshift, you go back in time, fewer halos have had time to form, and in particular, fewer massive halos. Um, so that's the typical shape of a, of a halo mass function. And you might hear of something called uh, universality, uh, which is the, the fact that um, uh, the halo mass function can often approximately be written um, as a function, uh, not directly of mass and redshift, but of the significance of the over density. So at a given uh, redshift and for a given halo mass, um, you can ask what's the variance of the matter density field on the scale de defined by the mass. 
and ask how that compares to a fixed threshold from spherical collapse. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a detail, but um, I just wanted you to have heard of this word of uh, universality of the halo mass function. Okay, so that was ingredient number one. I'm gonna move to ingredient uh, number two. Um, and again, at any time, feel free to interrupt if there's anything that's unclear. Uh, since we're in a small group, um, this is perfect for doing this. So um, moving on to ingredient uh, number two, halo profiles. Um, so we know how many halos of each mass there are. That's the halo mass function. Now we'd like to know um, how is the mass distributed within a halo. And these are the halo profiles. It turns out if you look at dark matter simulations, so n-body simulations, what you find is that uh, the, the density profile of halos are well fit uh, by some of these fitting functions, uh, the NFW or navarro frank wine fitting function, uh, and the INASTO profile. So I've, I've um, written their expressions here. Um, and the one that I think is most commonly used is this NFW profile. So it's, it's characterized by one free amplitude um, and uh, one scale for the radius. And you can see that the, the scale dependence as a function of radius r uh, is basically a, a broken power law. So when the radius is small, uh, and this quantity is basically one, you see that the profile goes down as one over r. But instead, when you're at, at large radii and uh, r over the scale radius is, is much larger than one, you find that the scale dependence of the profile is more like r cubed. Okay, so NFW profile, broken power law, one over r and one over r cubed. And um, this is what is shown on this plot, one over r and then one over r cubed. Um, something that's uh, somewhat intriguing uh, about these profiles is that is again an issue of universality, but here a slightly different meaning. Um, um, this is sort of an unsolved problem, but there's this idea that uh, those NFW profiles would naturally arise from the statmec of gravitational systems, meaning that uh, all halos would sort of look like this, regardless of the initial conditions of the universe, uh, just because of how gravity clumps things together. Um, and this is sort of a, a longstanding open question. And I thought I would just mention it um, so that you've heard of it. And if you're interested in, in counter arguments to this, uh, you can look at this paper. So um, I described the two slopes of that broken power law for NFW, one over R, one over R cubed. Um, one thing that you might hear about is this concept of cusp, the fact that the, the matter density at zero radius is infinite. So this this peak in, in density. And another thing I should uh, draw your attention to is the fact that um, since at large radii, this profile goes down as a one over R cubed. Um, if you integrate over radius to get the total mass within that profile, you find something infinite. Um, so that's somewhat unfortunate that this fitting function gives you an infinite profile. And it's related to the fact that this profile has been measured into in simulation just out to some uh, radius. And so this profile is typically truncated when used in a halo model, meaning past a certain radius, uh, people just set it to zero. Um, so that, that's good to keep in mind. And here I talked only about uh, dark matter density profiles, but really in your halo models, you'll need the halo profile for whatever quantity you're interested in. So if you're interested in predicted instead the clustering of galaxies, what you'll need is the galaxy profile. If you care about uh, the gas mass, you'll need the gas mass profile of the halos um, and so on. Okay, so now we know how many halos of each mass there are. Uh, we know what their profiles look like. Um, the last thing we need to know is uh, where are these halos located? How clustered are they? And um, of course, if, if you look at those two pictures, what you see is that uh, those dots, those individual halos on the right-hand side, um, sort of traces the, trace the over densities you see in the n-body simulation. And so in the very simplest um, halo model, uh, we typically assume that uh, halos are a biased Poisson sampling of the matter density field. So let me, let me break this down. Um, they, um, they are a biased uh, tracer of the matter density field. And I'll say what that means in a moment. And they are a Poisson sampling. Uh, and again, I'll explain what that means. But so basically, this assumption of, of Poisson sampling means that where you have more density, matter density, you'll have more halos. And exactly how many halos you'll have is a Poisson random variable. And that uh, Poisson distribution uh, is appropriate uh, every time you have independent rare events. So uh, when we assume a Poisson sampling, 
we assume that halos are rare events that occur independently, meaning um, if I happen to have a fluctuation in one more halos here, that does not influence um, whether or not I will have more there. So that's the, the Poisson part. And then uh, the biased part um, means the following. Um, if halos had formed uni um, uniformly in the initial conditions in the universe, and then we're just advected under gravity, just like the matter is, um, what you would find is that uh, halos would be an unbiased tracer of the matter density. And what that means is that uh, the halo number over density, which is the ratio of the variation in the number of halo uh, over the mean, would be equal to the matter over density. So uh, delta halo, the halo number over density, equals delta matter, the matter over density. That's the definition of an, what we call an unbiased tracer. Uh, the overdensity in halo is exactly equal to the overdensity in matter. Um, but in reality, this is not the case. Uh, the halos don't just form uniformly, randomly in the initial conditions. They form only um, in the high density environments in the initial conditions. And uh, as a result, the halos are actually more clustered um, than, the, than the matter. And this can be encoded to lowest order by this bias coefficient. So uh, this bias, which depends on the mass and the redshift of the halo and relates the matter over density to the halo number over density, uh, determines how clustered the halos are compared to the matter. If the bias is equal to zero, uh, it means delta halo is zero. There is no fluctuation in the halo density. The halos are perfectly uniformly distributed. So this never happens. If the bias was one, uh, it means the fluctuation in the halo number density are the same as the fluctuation in matter over density. And that's what we would call an unbiased tracer of the mass. And in reality, depending on the mass, this bias can take uh, a number of different values. And this is what I'm going to show you right now. So here, B1, or same as B before, this uh, linear bias, um, I have plotted as a function of mass for different redshifts. And so again, if you look at the black line at redshift zero, what you find is that uh, the bias is equal to one. And so some of the halos are unbiased tracer of the mass for halos of about 10 to the 13 solar mass. And then if you look at more massive halos, the bias is larger than one, uh, meaning those halos are more clustered than the mass uh, because they formed in overdense region. And if you look at uh, lower mass halos, their bias is less than one, uh, meaning they are less clustered um, than the matter density field. Um, so that's this question of linear bias. Um, and again, feel free to uh, interrupt or, or ask any question you have on this. So um, I guess how good of an approximation is it that bias should only depend on the mass of the halo? And then also NFW, two free parameters there. The simplest model, I guess, those also just depend on the mass or right. reality, how good of an approximation is that? Right, so that's a good question. Um, so maybe I'll start with the, the question about the bias and the, the assumption that it depends only on mass. Uh, and I should say here, we're making a bit more than this assumption. We are here assuming linear bias, yeah. meaning that the halo over density is linear in the, in the matter density. Um, as you know, you can go to high order in the matter density. Um, so that's um, one limitation of this model. Another one, like you say, is we assume this depends only on mass. Um, and um, we are currently looking at extensions of this in actual data. Um, and these things going beyond the mass dependence is often called assembly bias. And the reason it's called this way is because um, the idea would be that uh, the bias of a halo doesn't depend only on the mass, but on some details of how it formed. And in practice, you can get handles on this uh, with things like halo concentration. Um, so if you look at a halo and you look at its profile, um, for a halos of a given mass, you may have variance in the profile. And this can be a clue as to um, how the halo formed. Um, and so that, that relates a bit this uh, dependence of the bias on more than mass and this question of um, this profile. So in the NFW profile, we typically assume that these quantities, rho naught and the scale radius are functions of mass. Uh, but again, uh, in practice, they may depend on other quantities. Um, and going beyond just the mass dependence is sort of an open problem right now. Uh, but uh, one thing we may have the sensitivity to, to detect in current data. Um, so that's a good thing to keep thinking about. And is there a straightforward just elliptical 
generalization of NFW. Yeah, Elliptical, you mean taking into account yeah. the triaxiality. Um, right. I mean, the, the simplest thing you can do is always a rescaling along each axis. axis. Yeah. Um, for the, um, uh, for the, um, the things that we're going to talk about today, this very cool approximation is, uh, is good enough. Um, but then, of course, you can go beyond. All right. And then um, just to finish with one quick analogy with this, um, this question of uh, what bias means, uh, something I like to think about is, is, is this analogy um, where uh, the mass in the universe is like the population on Earth and the individual halos are like cities. Um, and that's just an image that can be helpful for thinking about these things. So if you look at you know, what the Earth looks like at night, you might see those individual bright dots. And these really tell you about cities. Um, but uh, in cosmology, you typically don't care about individual galaxies or halos. You want to know about the mass distribution. Here, the analogy would be you may, you may be an alien who would like to know where humans are on Earth. And so what you may care about is population and ask, how can I learn about where people are? And so your first guess might be to say, well, where there are more cities, surely there are more people. Um, and if you, if you look at actually where the people are and you flip uh, between these two, uh, you'll find that it's a pretty good approximation um, where you have more cities or more halos, you have more mass or more people. Um, and then you can also see limitations of this approximation, the fact that uh, in some places you may have uh, not many cities, uh, but a lot of population. And that's um, saying that cities are a biased tracer of the population, just like halos are a biased uh, tracer of the mass. Um, okay, so that, that's all I wanted to say about uh, halo bias. So um, just to reiterate, we talked about how many halos there are as a function of mass and redshift. Uh, we talked about their profiles, how big those halos are. And now we just talked about where they are, how the halos, the individual halos trace the matter over density. And uh, before combining all these ingredients to uh, predict some statistics, I just wanted to mention those consistency relations between these ingredients. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the key assumption of the halo model is that all the mass is inside of halos. And uh, in terms of, of mean density of the universe, you can translate into this constraint. Um, so if you forget about rho bar here, this integral tells me dm n of m is how many halos I have of mass m per unit volume times their mass. So I have number density of halos times their mass, that's the mass density. And that quantity should be equal to rho bar, uh, the mean matter density in the universe. Uh, so if you divide by rho bar, you get this integral that should uh, be equal to unity. And that's uh, the first consistency relation on your halo model, is that um, if you want that all the mass is inside of halos, you need your halo mass function to be normalized in this way. Um, the second, con the, or the, ne the next consistency relations come from uh, the fact that Again, we've assumed all the mass is inside halos. And so in particular, uh, the mass over density field uh, can be determined if you know the halo over density field, simply by saying, if you weight all of your halos of mass M um, by their mass and by how many there are, um, you should recover the total matter density field. Um, but here you have related the matter density field to the halo number density field. But as we said, this quantity is also related to the matter density field through the bias. And so we talked about this uh, linear bias model. And if you want, you can also go to high order. But if you keep only this linear bias model and you plug this into here, you find that delta matter is equal to some integral of B1 times delta matter. And so that whole integral has to be equal to one. And this is this integral. So again, in your halo model, if you want uh, all the mass to be inside of halos, um, what you need is that whatever halo mass function and bias model you're using, they have to satisfy this consistency. And uh, if I go to high order in biasing, for example, second order, uh, where the halo matter density field depends on the square of the matter density field, um, again, because of this constraint and you have no second order term on this side, uh, you need the integral you get to be equal to zero. And this is this uh, next consistency relation. Um, so this is just something I wanted you to have heard about this issue of consistency relation. And um, we'll say a little bit more about this towards the end when we talk about limitations of the halo model. Um, but for now, that's it for the ingredients of the halo model. 
Uh, so we have the hello mass function, we have the hello profile, and we have hello bias. So how do we combine these things to predict um, some observables? And the observable we'll start with is the nonlinear matter power spectrum. Um, so if you, if you bear with me, there will be a few slides of uh, derivation that I'll walk you through. Um, and after that, um, it'll be much less dense and we'll just look at applications of the HALO model. Okay, so say I would like to derive the nonlinear matter power spectrum in this HALO model. Um, how do I do this? Um, and so as we've seen, there's a relationship between the matter density field and the HALO density. The fact that to get the matter density field, all I need to do is take my HALO over density field for each HALO mass and weigh them by how many HALOs of that mass I have and uh, how massive those halos are. Uh, what you see here is this additional term, u of k and m, and that is um, the Fourier transform of the halo profile that we talked about. So that's an NFW function, but in Fourier space. The reason I'm switching to Fourier space as, a, as opposed to real space is you can see here, I have the product of two functions of k. Um, and in real space, this would be a convolution. And so writing it in Fourier space um, it's convenient to avoid those convolutions. Okay, so um, we, have, um, we have an expression for the matter density field as a function of all our ingredients, halo mass function, halo profile, and uh, halo over density, uh, which we know how to express in terms of bias. Okay, so given this matter over density field, what is its power spectrum? Um, to get the power spectrum, what I'll do is multiply this quantity uh, by itself, but minus k. And so I had one integral. Um, when I do that multiplication, I'll get two integrals. So dm n m over rho bar u, dm n m over rho bar u. And um, for the second delta, I get, again, the same integral, but with m prime instead of m. And when I take the expectation value, I get this uh, expectation value of the product of the halo over densities at mass m and m prime. And uh, the key insight uh, of the HALO model is that um, this quantity, which is the power spectrum of the HALO number density, uh, can be expressed as follows. Linear bias uh, at mass m, linear bias at mass m prime, times the linear matter power spectrum, uh, plus an extra term, um, which is a shot noise term. And it's the shot noise of HALOs and uh, it scales as one over the mean number density of halos. So if I now plug this sum of two terms in this double integral, um, what I get is that the power spectrum is the sum of two terms. And uh, starting, uh, if I start with those B terms, what you see is that P lin here goes out of the integral and B of M, B of M prime makes this whole thing separable. What I end up with is this so-called two halo term. So again, P lin, outside of the integral, the integral of mass, which you can see here, n m over rho u, n m over rho uh, u, and uh, the bias uh, right here. So uh, this is the so-called uh, two halo term. And finally, if you, um, if you plug in this second term in here, uh, this delta Dirac in mass kills the second integral in mass. And uh, this one over n kills one of the two n's of m. So you end up with only one integral, only one halo mass function as opposed of two. And you get the m over rho bar squared and the u squared. And uh, this is called the one halo term. Um, so now why are these terms called two halo and one halo term? Um, I'll explain a bit more about this. Um, but uh, you can think of them schematically as being the clustering for halos uh, of the same mass or particles coming from the same halo um, for the two halo term and, oh, sorry, for the one halo term and for the two halo term being particle coming from two different halos of two different masses. So uh, let me just uh, rewrite this expression uh, again in this slide. So the power spectrum of matter is the sum of a one halo and a two halo term. And uh, let's look at what these terms uh, look like in practice when you evaluate them. Uh, this is a calculation, again, you can do with the code on the repository I listed. So here's the matter power spectrum as a function of scale. And dashed line is the linear matter power spectrum. Uh, you can get it from CAM, for example. And uh, again, we'd like to predict the nonlinear power spectrum. The halo model gives it to us as a sum of this two halo term 
this one halo term. The two halo term you can see in blue looks very similar to the linear power spectrum on most scales. Um, where, and the one halo term is um, a really new term. It looks constant on large scales and then uh, goes down. And uh, at the scales at which it goes down are determined by this profile u of k. So um, this curve you're seeing here is really just the Fourier transform of the halo profile properly weighted by mass. Um, so that's the one halo term. It tells you about the halo profiles and it adds a large contribution to the matter power spectrum on small scales. The two halo term, um, as we described, matches uh, very well the linear power spectrum on large scales. Um, and this should not be a, a surprise. Uh, it has to do with the fact that if you forget about this U profile, uh, which is constant and uh, one on large scales, this integral here is exactly the consistency relation we talked about for bias. And so on large scale where the profile is irrelevant and it's just one, um, this integral goes to unity. And this is why on large scales, uh, the two halo term matches the linear power spectrum. On small scales, this profile start to go down, um, just like you see in the, in the one halo term. So this turnover here in the one halo term is the scale dependence of the profile. And the same thing happens in this integral for the two halo term, causing the two halo term to uh, drop below the linear power spectrum on small scales. Okay, so um, um, this, is, um, this is one of the key results of the, the halo model uh, predicting the nonlinear matter power spectrum. Uh, we talked about uh, this two halo term where you can think of this overall integral as an effective bias. Effective because it's, um, it's um, an average of the halo bias, average over mass, weighted by how many halos there are, how massive they are. So uh, the two halo term is the linear power spectrum times an effective bias. And again, this bias goes to unity on large scales. And uh, the one halo term on the other hand, uh, which comes from this uh, shot noise of halos, and I'll say more about this, um, has this cutoff on small scales and basically tells you about the halo profile. Um, so this is already kind of interesting that with some three simple ingredients, halo mass function, halo profile, and halo bias, uh, we can predict the nonlinear matter power spectrum. And um, um, so that, that's one of the key results of the, the halo model. Um, and now um, I could go into more details about uh, this one step in the derivation, uh, this thing that I, I asked you to, to accept, the fact that the halo, uh, the power spectrum of the halo number of a density is related to the linear matter power spectrum with a linear bias plus this shot noise term. Um, and I think what I'll do um, is keep this derivation in the slides that I'll, I'll give you guys afterwards so you can look in detail. Um, and instead, I'll give a simpler sort of schematic derivation for where this shot noise comes from. Um, and so this is, um, this is what I'll do now. Okay, um, so the question was, uh, when we look at the power spectrum of the halo number over density, why is there this additional shot noise term? Uh, where does it come from? And um, we called it a one halo term, meaning this is the clustering when uh, two points are within the same halo. Um, where does that come from? So here is, I think, the shortest and uh, simplest derivation of this. It comes from this uh, paper by Tobias Baldov, uh, which I really recommend, super pedagogical. Um, and here's how it goes. Um, so here, this uh, delta D is basically our delta H. Um, so the halo uh, number over density, uh, which is related to the, the local number density of halos over the mean. And uh, you can express this quantity as a sum over all the individual halos. Um, because the, the mean, num the number density of halos is basically the sum of a Dirac delta at the position Ri of halos. So um, the halo number density is the sum of Dirac's at the position of halos. And here the sum is over halos. Okay, so given this halo over density, uh, what is its uh, correlation function in real space? Um, you can obtain this quantity by just taking the mean of the halo over density at R times the halo over density at say the origin. And uh, this is now just algebra. So you have two sums, sum over I for the first term, sum over J in the second term. Um, and this is what uh, you get here. And because you have the minus ones, 
you end up with the minus one squared, that's plus one, and the cross products, minus one times the sum, and these are these sums. Something you'll notice is that uh, once you put the expectation value, uh, the sum over these Dirac's, uh, the average of it is the mean number density of halo, so that's n bar. So this term gives me n bar over n bar, which is one. Similarly, this term gives me n bar over n bar, uh, which is one. And so I have minus one, minus one, plus one. That gives me minus one. That's this minus one. Now let's deal with this term. We have this double sum. And here, it's helpful to sum this term, to split the sum into the cases where i and j are different, meaning um, we're looking at two points in two different halos. Uh, and the case where uh, i equals j, and so the two points are i and rj are in the same halo. Um, so when you look at i equals j, um, what you get is uh, the product of a function that's uh, delta Dirac at ri, ri, and this delta Dirac. So for this to be non-zero, uh, when i equals j, you need r to be equal to ri, that's this delta function, and you need rj, which is ri, since i equals j, uh, to be zero. And so because r is ri, you need r to be zero. So uh, this term, when i equals j, gives you this. So you still have the one over n bar. You have a direct delta of r, and you have this quantity, uh, which again is the mean number density of halos. OK, so that was the part where i equals j. Then in this sum, you have the part where i is different from j. And here, we just repeated it here there. OK, um, so again, the expectation value of this sum is n bar. So I end up with n bar over n bar squared. So that's 1 over n bar. And um, um, what uh, you see here in this derivation is that uh, you end up with this extra term, this delta Dirac at the origin in the correlation function of the halo number density. And um, this is a term that's non-zero only, uh, basically, if your two points are within the same halo. And so that's this. That's why it's called the one halo term. And that's why it scales as um, one over n bar. So th th that's the derivation for this uh, uh, one halo term. Now, if you want more detail about this additional term that I haven't talked about, um, I'll invite you to look at the slides and I'll put them online um, for you to see after the, the lecture. OK, um, so sorry, that was a lot to swallow. Um, but uh, really, all I want you to remember about this is that given the halo mass function, the halo bias, and the halo profile. The halo model lets you predict the nonlinear matter power spectrum as a sum of two terms. The two halo term, which is very similar to the linear power spectrum, and has to do with the clustering of halos. And the one halo term, which is a, a shot noise from the discreteness of individual halos. And it's flat on large scales, and it goes down with the profile. So if you really just remember this, um, that would be a success. Um, and I'm now going to move on to talk about other observables. So if there are questions on this, um, that would be a good time to ask. Sorry, it's, it's nonlinear because you're measuring the nonlinear halo power spectrum and then from that inferring the matter. Right, so the-, the... Model. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the reason this predicts the, the nonlinear um, matter power spectrum is because the idea is that the, the, the number density of halos on large scale traces the large scale density field, which is the, the linear density field. Um, but by capturing the fact that the matter has collapsed into those halos, uh, you are capturing the nonlinearities of the evolution under gravity. So um, if instead of putting your mass inside of halos, you kept them uh, diffused like the large scale matter density field, you would have this linear power spectrum. But once you put all the mass inside of those individual halos, um, you get this additional term. And so this additional term here on small scales uh, describe the nonlinearity of the evolution of the matter density field under gravity. Okay. And if you include the higher order bias terms, you still end up with just one and two of halo terms, but that's only because of our choice and our consistency condition. Right. Um, so there is a bit of subtlety, um, and I, I sort of um, swept this under the rug. Uh, 
um, and the subtlety is um, um, in this question of, of linear bias. Um, I related the, the halo number density field to the matter density field. And here I was a bit schematic in not specifying whether this was the linear or nonlinear matter density field. Um, and different halo models uh, differ in the implementation. So some people might put the linear or the nonlinear matter density field. And um, some people might include higher order terms. And um, this makes the halo model a bit more uh, complicated. Um, in the simplest form, it modifies the two halo term. And so what you might often see is that um, instead of having the two halo term look a lot like the linear power spectrum, you might have the two halo term look a lot like uh, the perturbation theory power spectrum mm -hmm. uh, with your given bias expansion. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. Thanks. No, that was a very good question. Um, sorry. The last question that I had was about the consistency conditions that we were writing mm -hmm. down. Are these um, are, I mean are these unique? Um, do you do you mean do they specify uniquely what the halo mass function bias should be or no, I mean uh, you can't derive the consistency relations. They're kind of a choice. Is that true? Right. Um, yes. So here, those consistency relations are a consequence of the assumption that all of the mass in the universe is inside of halos. Um, and um, this is something I'll talk about at the end, uh, because this is an assumption you can question. Is all the mass in the universe really in halos, or is there diffuse mass around them? And um, what you find in when you look at simulations is that uh, the halos you're able to measure uh, do not account for all of the mass. And so there are tricks uh, to make those consistency uh, relations valid. And so I'll say, I'll say more about this, uh, but basically, yeah, this is a very good question of whether or not you should trust those consistency relations given that they come from this assumption. Uh, okay. And so I'll say a bit more about this. Um, and if not, uh, don't hesitate to ask again. Cool, thank you so much. Um, any other questions before we move on? All right. Um, so in that case, I'll move on to talk about um, other applications of the HALO model, meaning applications to other observables than uh, the matter power spectrum or the matter density field. Um, and the reason for this is because there are a lot of models out there for the nonlinear power, matter power spectrum. This is something you can simply measure in, in simulations. There are a lot of perturbation theory models um, that do very well at this. And so if this was the only selling point of the HALO model, uh, maybe it wouldn't be very interesting. But it turns out there's a lot of other um, selling points. Um, so first thing I wanted to say is once you have the, the power spectrum of any 3D observable, uh, which I called here X3D, and that could be the 3D matter density field, or that could be the 3D number density field of galaxies, for example. Um, it's easy to um, convert it into the power spectrum of 2D observables, like the 2D number density field of galaxies for a photometric survey. Or uh, one useful application is that of gravitational lensing. Um, and so a lot of people are working on measuring gravitational lensing of the cosmic microwave background or of galaxies. But in all cases, um, the lensing field is simply the projection along the line of sight, uh, where chi here is the moving radial distance of the matter density field with some, um, some redshift kernel. And so here, um, this plot shows you what a redshift kernel might look like. So um, if you care about lensing of the CMB, which comes from redshift 1000, the CMB lensing uh, has this kernel speaking at redshift about two and very broad, meaning the lensing is caused by uh, this integral over the line of sight of the matter density field uh, with this kernel. And here in red, I'm just showing uh, the equivalent for galaxy lensing. But um, the point is once you have a model for the, say the 3D nonlinear matter density field, you can then uh, therefore get a, a model for the 2D power spectrum of lensing. Uh, 
by uh, computing this integral. So this is the so-called limber approximation and flat sky approximation. Um, you may have heard about this uh, already in class or you might at some point. Uh, so I won't say too much about this, but I just wanted to advertise that once you have a model for the 3D matter density field from, for example, the HEDO model, you can use this to predict CMB lensing or galaxy lensing. So that's already one application of the HALO model. An other application is uh, other observables. So instead of caring about the matter density field, um, here I'm pointing one, one another application, the so-called thermal sunyev zeldovich effect. Uh, this is something you may or may not have heard about. And it's the fact that um, as the cosmic microwave backgrounds photons travel from the surface of glass scattering towards us, they may encounter clusters. And these clusters have hot gas with free electrons. And uh, these, uh, this, this hot gas around clusters imprints a shadow on the cosmic microwave background. And uh, this shadow is a change in the, the temperature that you see due to this thermal sunyev zeldovich effect. It has a known frequency dependence and uh, its amplitude is determined by an integral along the line of sight of uh, the product of density times temperature of those electrons in the gas. And so here we're again in the case of a 2D quantity. So you have a 2D map of the CMB. And the effect here, the sunyev zeldovich effect, is a projection along line of sight of 3D quantities, uh, which is um, number density times temperature of electrons. And so people have uh, built HALO models um, for the number density times temperature of electrons. And that um, once you know those profiles of HALOs, since we know the HALO mass function, the HALO bias, we can predict at the power spectrum. And so here's a prediction for this CLY, the power spectrum of this Compton Y parameter, which uh, again, determines the amplitude of the SZ effect. And so the HALO model tells you what this power spectrum is as a function of angular scales, little L here. And um, the shape might look different from what we've seen before, but again, you have sort of two terms. Uh, one, uh, which is negligible on small scales, but large on large scales is this two HALO term. And uh, the other term uh, here is the one halo term, which dominates uh, on small scales at higher. So uh, you can already see that the halo model is pretty versatile because these ingredients of halo mass function and halo bias um, are still useful here, just the same. The only change is that the halo profile, instead of being an NFW profile for the matter density profile, is just an electron profile of density times temperature. And once you have that ingredient, you can predict um, the power spectrum of this observable. Um, another very important observable that the HALO model is often used to predict is galaxy clustering. And so uh, you'd like to know, for example, what is the power spectrum of the number density of galaxies? And um, to do this, again, you use the same HALO mass function, the same HALO bias, um, and you'd like to know what's then the HALO profile in terms of galaxies. And this is typically parameterized by something we call a HALO occupation distribution or HOD. And it says that <clears throat> for a HALO of mass M, uh, you have a certain number of central galaxies, uh, typically zero or one um, that sit in the center of your HALO and a certain number of satellite galaxies um, of which you can have many that uh, follow often the NFW profile of the galaxy. So that's a, a typical prescription a typical HOD, halo occupation distribution. And uh, here there's many curves, but I'm showing examples of such HODs. Uh, in the case of um, galaxies like luminous red galaxies that are selected based on their brightness. And what you can see here is the mean number as a function of mass. In red is the number of centrals. And so at low mass, you have basically 10 to minus one or less. So basically no central galaxies in those low mass halos. And at high mass, uh, this gets too close to one, meaning all high mass halos will have one central galaxy. Then in blue, this quantity is the number of satellite galaxies. And this says, as the mass goes down, you have fewer and fewer satellite galaxies. But as the mass increases, you can have arbitrarily large number of galaxies, something like 10 in this example. Um, so that's, that's a halo occupation distribution. Um, here, for I just wanted to show in this plot for emission line galaxies that those quantities are not necessarily growing monotonically with mass. Um, and this is often the case where you look at galaxies that are not selected based on their 
uh, the fact that they're bright and red, but based on their star formation rate. And the reason for this is that when you go to high masses, um, there's a number of quenching processes that kill star formation and will therefore reduce the number of central galaxies you might be able to find. So this is sort of a, a slight digression, but I just wanted to show you what an HOD is and uh, two examples you might encounter of this halo occupation distributions. Once you plug this into your halo model, so again, the same halo mass function, the same halo bias, but now this HOD, um, you get the power spectrum of galaxies. And so you still have this two halo term that we talked about. You still have this one halo term, which is the shot noise of individual halos. But now you have an additional term, which is the shot noise of individual galaxies. So as we've seen in the quick derivation, as soon as you have discrete objects, and uh, before it was halos, you end up with a halo shot noise. But now not only do you have discrete halos, you have discrete galaxies inside of those halos. And as a result, you end up um, with a shot noise of galaxies. Um, the expression for the two halo term looks very similar to what we had before, um, but now the profile is replaced by this HOD, where USAT is a distribution of satellites, typically in FW. Um, and again, the, the one halo term looks similar in that it's only a single integral over mass. Um, and finally, you get this, uh, this shot noise term uh, due to the discreteness of galaxies. Uh, to give you an idea of what that might look like, um, for the HOD I showed you here for luminous red galaxies, the power spectrum you might find is something like this, where again, two halo, um, two halo here uh, in blue uh, describes the clustering, uh, one halo uh, in red, the shot noise of halos, and here this new uh, shot noise term uh, in green, which happens to be very large uh, on a number of scales. And uh, finally, um, I wanted to point out something that's, um, um, uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, you might find that a lot of times when people measure the correlation function of galaxies, uh, those galaxies are found to follow a power low clustering. And the halo model helps to explain why that is. And so here, what you have is this correlation function of galaxies as a function of separation. And if you look at this uh, panel at redshift zero, uh, you find that um, a conspiracy occurs between uh, the one halo term on small scales and the two halo term on large scales, such that their sum looks almost like a power law. Um, so this is, um, this is an interesting fact that the halo model allows to explain. And uh, because the one halo term and two halo term scale differently with redshift, as you move to different redshifts, that coincidence is broken. Okay, so we've used the halo model to um, uh, predict the clustering of matter, lensing, the Sunyev Zablovich effect, uh, galaxy clustering. Uh, you can also use it for other observables like intensity mapping. Uh, and intensity mapping is this um, way of looking at the large scale structure where instead of in the, uh, identifying individual galaxies, what you do is you measure the integrated emission from all the galaxies within your pixels. And so you do not uh, require that you resolve individual galaxies you're just measuring the blended total emission. And uh, here too, the halo model is very useful. Um, it lets you relate uh, the galaxy luminosity functions. So how many galaxies are there of a given luminosity to their power spectrum? And so I won't uh, enter into more details on this. I just, um, I just wanted to, uh, you to know that this is one a very valid application of the halo model. Okay, um, so we've talked about power spectrum of many different uh, observables. I'm going to talk about other things that the HALO model allows you to predict. Um, and so if there are any questions now, uh, feel free to ask. Um, so if not, I'll, I'll keep going and talk about higher order correlators. And um, I do not expect you to understand all of these cryptic schematics, uh, but what I wanted to show is that uh, the HALO model lets you um, predict correlators of higher point than just two points, so not just the power spectrum, but it also lets you predict the bispectrum, which is the three point function, and the tri spectrum, which is the four point function. And uh, those schematics here describe the various terms we talked about, the two HALO term, where the two 
points of interest one and two lying at two different halos. The one halo turn where the two points or the two galaxies of interest are in the same halo and the galaxy shot noise term where we're looking twice at the same galaxy. And uh, the same kind of combinatorics occurs in higher point functions uh, where now instead of having a two halo, one halo term and a shot noise, you might have a three halo, uh, various two halo terms, um, various one halo terms and one shot noise. And so the, the, halo, the halo model lets you go to higher order and uh, split the high point function, for example, the tri-spectrum as a sum of many four halo, three halo, two halo, uh, et cetera terms. Uh, and so that, that's sort of a nice property of the halo model um, is that it lets you go to higher point function than you would otherwise be able to do. And uh, to give you an example, um, this is some of the various terms that go into the uh, bispectrum of galaxy as a function of scale uh, in a specific configuration. And so um, what you should see is it, it gets complicated in that there are many, many terms that appear uh, more and more as you go to higher and higher order. Um, and also, I would encourage you to always be cautious when looking at higher order correlators from the HALO model, because most HALO models have been calibrated to produce the right power spectrum, um, but not necessarily to produce the right higher point function. So this is always something to keep in mind, um, but it's still a nice property of the HALO model. Um, and finally, and related to being able to predict higher point function, another thing that the HALO model predicts is covariances. For example, covariance between power spectrum at one scale and the power spectrum at another scale, or covariance between the power spectrum and the bias spectrum, or uh, importantly, the correlation between your endpoint function and cluster counts. And to give you an idea of how this works, um, intuitively, it's fairly simple. Uh, your power spectrum or your endpoint function in the halo model is a sum over the number of halos. So if you now know which halos host uh, clusters, you can clearly see what the, the correlation is between those clusters and your power spectrum or your endpoint function. And so um, this plot here is, is just an example of a, co a covariance between a number of clusters and the lensing power spectrum. And uh, you can do these calculations in the HALO model for any number of observables. Uh, and so that, that's, um, in my mind, one of the, the key values of the HALO model is uh, this covariance with the number of clusters that's otherwise quite hard to predict. Um, so I think I'll stop there for the various applications of the HALO model. So we've talked about power spectrum of very many quantities. Uh, we've talked about bispectrum, tri-spectrum, covariances of power spectrum and number counts. So um, if you ever need to compute any such thing, um, you might want to think about the HALO model as a good way to estimate it. And uh, now in the last few minutes, I'll briefly go over some of the uh, known issues and limitations of the HALO model. And depending on your application, these may or may not be a showstopper, uh, but regardless, it's good for you to be aware of them. Um, so the, the first known issue that I want to talk about is the one that uh, Noah raised earlier uh, in relation with those consistency relations. So the first one, if you remember, was this idea that all of the mass is in halos. And so if I sum all of the halos in the universe weighted by their mass, I should get the total matter density field in the universe. Now in practice, the halo mass function is only measured from simulations down to a certain minimum mass under which you don't resolve halos. And so when you compute this integral as a function of the minimum mass, so when you compute this integral here as a function of the minimum mass, as the minimum mass goes down and down and down, um, you get closer and closer to unity. And uh, you would hope, for example, at redshift zero, that at some point you would reach uni a unity. But uh, with a lot of halo mass function fitting functions, you find that that's not the case. So for example, at redshift zero, even when you go to incredibly small halo masses, you find that only about 0.5 or 50% of the mass is actually inside of your halos. The same issue occurs for the second consistency relation that involves the bias, um, where when you compute that uh, integral and you uh, hope to get unity, when you go down and down in the minimum mass, for example, at redshift zero, you find that you don't quite uh, reach unity. 
So depending on the observable you care about, uh, this may or may not be a problem. If you care about the matter power spectrum, this is a problem. If you care about observables where only the highest mass contributes, for example, if your galaxies only live in massive halos, or for example, the thermo IZ, which only cares about massive clusters, then it's not an issue. But in all cases, when you ever use a halo model, um, you should always check for the convergence of your mass integrals. And um, if those integrals do not converge because not all the mass is in your halos, a typical fix that people use is to add these counter terms with the low masses. And so I won't say too much more about this, but this is a very simple fix um, that allows you to satisfy the consistency relations. So that's one of the key issues that I think is most often encountered. The second one is this question of the, the one halo term on large scales. So if you remember, this is the matter power spectrum as a function of scale. And um, as I explained, this, this one halo term uh, is what makes the power spectrum differ from the linear power spectrum mostly. And it's a correction that matters on small scales. Um, but what's not shown on this plot is that this one halo term is constant with k. Uh, so it stays flat forever. Whereas the linear power spectrum goes down to zero as k goes to zero. And so if you go on large enough scales, your halo model power spectrum is dominated by the one halo term. And uh, this, is, um, this is an unphysical effect. The reason we know this is unphysical is um, uh, mass and momentum conservation, you can show that they require any deviation from the linear power spectrum to go down uh, at low and so this, this one halo term is, is forbidden by mass and momentum conservation. And the reason it appears here is because the halo model, the way we phrased it, violates those conservations. One, if you remember, we assume that uh, the number density of halo is Poisson, meaning rare independent events. And this violates mass conservation because if you want to conserve mass and you form one more halo here, the number density of halo uh, left cannot be independent. There has to be fewer halos such that the total mass is conserved. If instead you assume things are independent, Poisson approximation, you will violate mass conservation. And second, our halo profiles, the NFW profiles, assume basically that the, the matter uh, is virialized instead of halos. I won't say too much about this, but basically this says that there's no memory of the initial velocities of those particles. And so this violates momentum conservation. So um, as soon as you care about scales larger than say 10 to the minus three, um, you do not care about any of these issues. But if you care about the very largest scales, for example, if you care about non-Gaussianity, then you may want to truncate your one halo term to avoid this spurious, um, this spurious contribution. So that's the, the second biggest issue uh, with the halo model. And again, for most applications where you care about small scales, it's not a big deal, um, but it's something that you should always be aware of. And um, finally, before we finish, the last limitation of the HALO model is its accuracy on intermediate scales. So um, what you see here is, again, the matter power spectrum as a function of scale. Blue is the HALO model prediction. And uh, red is HALO fit, which is a fitting function to simulations. And uh, what you might see is that uh, the fit is very, the, the two curves match very well on large scales, where linear theory is valid. And they match quite well on very small scales where you are indeed dominated by the halo profile. But the match is not excellent on those intermediate, mildly nonlinear scales. And um, again, this has to do with our assumptions of uh, Poisson halos and of linear bias. And so if you care about high precision on mildly nonlinear scales for matter, the halo model may not be the tool for you. Uh, but if instead you care about um, the very small scales, the highly nonlinear uh, regime, and for example, that's often the case for other observables like SC, uh, then the halo model is a good choice. Okay, so these were the three um, known issues of the halo model that I wanted to point out. So one, that all of the mass is not always fine in found inside of your uh, halos. Two, this spurious one halo term on large scales. And three, this not great accuracy on intermediate scales. And so um, I'll just uh, conclude with the things um, I started with. So one, hopefully um, you have some understanding now of what the HALO model is and how it lets you model the statistics of various large scale structure observables. Uh, 
uh, tried to show you how it's very versatile in predicting power spectra of many different observables, um, but also quantities like number counts of clusters, number counts of galaxy, galaxy luminosity functions. The fact that not only do you predict the power spectrum, but also high order statistics. Um, and this is often very useful and coherences. The fact that um, the halo model is very simple, only a handful of physical ingredients, if you remember, halo mass function, halo bias, halo profile, and that's it. And uh, the fact that it can uh, give you some intuition as to why the power spectrum looks the way it is by relating properties of galaxies, for example, luminosity function uh, with their endpoint correlators. And uh, finally, um, we talked about the various approximations that go in the halo model and their limitations. So things like assuming Poisson, uh, Poisson halos and linear bias, uh, which violates mass and momentum conservation. Um, and so uh, that's the end of this lecture. Uh, if there's any question, uh, feel free to stay on and, and ask. Um, and otherwise those slides will be put online, uh, including the list of references at the start, uh, which would be a really good starting point if you wanna uh, learn more about any of this. Um, so um, this is the end. And if there's any question, please uh, feel free to ask now. Are there modifications to the HALO model that you know of that try and change the statistics of how HALOs populate the matter in a way that conserves mass? Right, yes. Um, so it, it turns out there, there are. Um, and so, right. So, so the two main limitations that cause this spurious one HALO term on large scales here are, um, this Poisson assumption and this assumption of linear bias. And it turns out uh, something called halo exclusion. The fact that um, if this point in space is inside of a halo, it cannot be inside of an other halo uh, because halos are defined to be non-overlapping. Um, this halo exclusion effect, kind of like hard, a hard sphere model in StatMec, um, means that uh, uh, it breaks this Poisson assumption and um, it, it kills part of this uh, one halo term on large scales. And uh, nonlinear bias uh, also contributes to this. So for example, terms like the, the B2 squared uh, also causes a scale independent term in the power spectrum. And, um, and so if you, if you can self-consistently include all these effects, uh, you would find that this one halo term uh, go to zero. Um, and so some of these, uh, um, some of the papers I listed here uh, do some of this. And so if you're interested in issues of halo exclusion and nonlinear bias, uh, these are good references. And uh, halo stochasticity or deviations from Poisson statistics, uh, this is also a very good reference. And are these just with n-body simulations or are these with analytical? Or... Um, here, uh, most of these papers here are um, analytical modeling okay. um, that basically try to include more ingredients to see how that uh, improves or worsens the problem. Cool. Um, cool, cool. Um, all right, yeah, so if there's, if there's no more question, um, maybe we'll stop here and I think uh, you guys will see Martin next week for the next uh, lecture. <laughs>